Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this, uh, the latest, and I think the last of the year, uh, in the lecture series that King's Chambers are giving. My name's Doug Cochran. Uh, I practice as part of the business and property team at King's, and I'll be giving today's uh, lecture. Um, it's December, which means it's CPD time. Uh, and if you so, which no doubt is is at least one of the motivating factors behind the relatively strong turnout we have today. I can see this this clearly over a hundred. If there are questions that occur uh, during the, the course of the presentation, uh, please do feel free to either pop those into the chat uh, or uh, to use the Q and A function, um, and I will do my best to field those as we go along. Today's uh, talk is on de facto directors and shadow directors. Um, they're two related concepts, and I'll be distinguishing between them as we go through. Um, those of you who will have seen the advertisement for today's talk will have seen that there are really three main objectives from today's talk. Uh, firstly, set out a definition uh, in respect of these, uh, these terms, de facto and shadow director, to consider how we can identify who would a de facto director or a shadow director is, uh, and to understand what consequences will follow. Um, so why do we care? Uh, and the answer is there's plenty of reasons why we might care about identifying those who are either shadow or uh, de facto directors. But the common bond is that there are ways of bringing in people who aren't de jure directors and putting them under the umbrella of what it is to be a director. So in the normal course of events, we go to company's house, uh, we have a look around, and what we see is uh, we, we we click on a few hyperlinks, and we see the list of directors who've been validly appointed. Um, shadow director and de facto director are terms that the courts use to apply to cases where someone has been affixed with the duties of a director or is treated as a director, even though they don't meet that standard. And there's plenty of contexts in which we do this. Um, one of which is, is that we want to point to someone and to say they owe this company duties uh, of the sort that a director would, even though they're not a de jure director. One of the cases where it comes up a lot is in the case of uh, director disqualification. So uh, the Secretary of State wants to disqualify someone from acting as a director, but they were never validly appointed as a director to begin with. Um, so their misfeasance... Uh, the misfeasance means that the Secretary of State wants to prevent them from acting as director, but needs to prove first that they were a director in the first place. And if they're not a de jure director, then there has to be some other way in which the Secretary of State can, can take that action. Um, another way is that we want to validate the actions of a company, or we want uh, either from the company's point of view or from a third party's point of view, by saying that this action was performed in fact by a director. Um, and as a result, the company is bound by it, even if the company doesn't want to be. In some cases, the company does want to be and wants to say, yes, yes, this person wasn't a de jure director, uh, but nevertheless, they were themselves a director. Um, and in one of the cases, one of the cases I, I tend to come across director's duties most frequently is in the area of insolvency, uh, where identifying who is and who isn't a director is, is of very great importance uh, in the context of insolvency. Um, interestingly, it's also in the context of insolvency that there is a distinguishment between uh, statutory directors, sorry, de jure directors and de facto directors and shadow directors. Um, shadow directors don't qualify under the provisions of Section 212, uh, the summary remedy that office holders can use as against delinquent directors, but de facto and de jure directors do. So there are times when we need to distinguish between exactly what form of director we're looking at and whether or not the identification of someone as a director as one sort or the other means that we can bring in all of the rights and responsibilities that go along with being a director. Um, we'll start with some simple definitions. Uh, the first of which, the first two of which are found in the Companies Act. Uh, Section 250 tells us quite simply that we, a director is a director uh, if they occupy the position of a director, uh, even if they don't go by that name. De facto directors are, are a creature of, of relatively recent creation in terms of what they're presently used for. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, de facto directors, we first hear about them in the 19th century case law, uh, and they're confined to a very limited set of circumstances. 
they are people who have been appointed a director or whom the company has attempted to appoint a director by the normal means. Um, but something's gone wrong. Uh, in some cases, the director has overstayed their welcome, they've overstayed their term of office, and they've carried on as a director. And in some cases, totally innocently, um, we find out later, actually, they weren't a director after all. Or they've gone through the process of being validated as a director, but there's been some formalities breach. But we all know what's going on. Everyone in the company is holding this person out as a director. The other thing that's very interesting about these old cases is that many of them don't involve directors behaving badly, for want of a better term. They involve cases where the company has had to go through a series of uh, steps in order to formalize a share issue or something of that effect by a director's uh, decision. But lo and behold, it turns out that Mr. Smith, who everyone knew was a director, wasn't a director after all. What are we going to do? And the courts create this concept of the de facto director uh, to st stand in the breach. So it's only very recently, uh, starting within my lifetime, that we've seen a gradual shift towards not someone who was appointed or ostensibly appointed or appointed for a period of time, who didn't quite make it in terms of formalities, um, being named a director, um, but also someone um, but also someone who has generally been acting as a director, even if they've never gone through that process whatsoever, even if the company has never attempted or purported to confer upon them um, the, the rights and duties of a director. Um, so what happens if you just show up one day and start acting like a director? Um, can you be a de facto director? Answer, yes, in theory. But that's a very recent vintage, the result being that the case law doesn't really go back um, much before the, the, the 1990s on this. One of the old cases, uh, this is the, the case of Canadian land reclaiming. I've cited um, um, some of, the, some of the, uh, the, the judgment given there by the master of the rules. Um, concerns, as I've said before, um, cases where the effect the... Um, the appointment was in some way defective. Uh, and in this case, there was no proper election. Um, and we have one of the first early statements in the 19th century uh, of what it is to be a de facto director. Um, and indeed, what the courts decide and what they develop is a theory by which those who have not been properly elected directors, but who are treated directors, uh, treated as directors, and who take on the responsibilities of directors, can't then turn around and say, nothing to do with me. What makes Canadian land reclaiming interesting is it's a case that has one of the two features I mentioned that's relatively late in coming, but not the other. It's a case where there was a defective appointment as opposed to no purported appointment, but it's also a case in which what makes it quite new as opposed to the earlier cases, this isn't the case of a company saying, oh, it's just a formalities breach, we did everything right, just wave it through. But it is a case of pointing to a director and saying, you are in some way liable or responsible because you took on these duties and you can't rely on this formalities breach to get you out of trouble. Rehydra Dam, uh, a judgment of Mr. Justice Millet, is one of the leading cases that takes us into the modern era. I say it's a leading case, but in many cases it's been criticised or refined. Um, but it sets out, at least to some extent, the definitions we presently use to distinguish between a de facto director and a shadow director. So as, as we've already seen, the de facto director is someone who shows up, acts like a director, but there's something wrong. There's some, uh, whether it's a formality that's been breached or whether there's no formal process that's been undergone. Uh, he's someone who quacks like a director and waddles like a director. And so we call him a director. A shadow director is somebody else. Um, and what uh, uh, Mr. Justice Millet said in Rehydrodam is uh, there are a non-overlapping set of, of persons uh, and a non-overlapping set of roles. Now, in practice, you probably do as I do. And in some cases, we get into a sticky situation and we plead that Mr. Jones was a shadow director or alternatively a de facto director of Company X. Um, and that's fine. Rehydrodam is a reminder, however, um, that they, these are alternative cases.
The lines, though, between a de facto director and a shadow director have started to blur. Uh, we'll talk about shadow directors in a moment. What Mr. Justice Millett says about de facto directors is, I think, in Rehydrodan, is slightly too ambitious. He says this can apply to everyone, not just who's not gone through an official process, um, but also who's claiming and purporting to be a director, even though his appointment is not valid. But there's a problem with that, as you might have seen already. There's an excluded middle case that's been left out. So we started with a classic definition where it was someone where the formalities were wrong. And Mr. Justice Millett has expanded that a bit further and said, OK, a de facto director can also be someone who's just holding themselves out, regardless of whether or not there's this appointment process and whether or not that's been undertaken at all. There's a further problem, though. What if you've never gone around saying you're a director, you've just done all the directory things? Um, the modern current of case law seems to be, and I've given an example here in Remorgate Medals, moving away from that stricture in Hydra Dam, which says to be a de facto director, what you've got to do is you've got to go around saying, I'm a director wearing my director's hat. Now, if you have been doing that, finding that you are a de facto director is likely to be pretty easy. But you don't need to go that far. You simply need to behave in the manner of a director. Now, that, as we'll see in as we go into the point of identification, uh, can often mean the identification process is, is somewhat difficult. We then turn to the question of being a shadow director. Now, a shadow director is a different creature than a de facto director. Uh, it's someone whose directions or instructions the directors of the company are accustomed to act in accordance with. Um, most importantly on this slide, I just have you turn your attention to subparagraph 2A, that there is an exception for those who have, are acting on advice given by that person in a professional capacity. Uh, that was an amendment added, I believe, by the coalition government in their early days uh, in order to, as a refinement uh, in order to exclude solicitors, accountants and the like, who might otherwise be thought to be caught by the strictures of being a shadow director because they give loads of advice and the directors tend to habitually act upon that. So we looked at the first half of what uh, Mr. Justice Millett was saying before about uh, the difference between shadow directors and de facto directors. And what he says here is interesting. He says the difference between the de facto director is a de facto director is running around holding himself out saying, I'm a director, I'm a director, even though he's not validly one. But a shadow director is lurking in the shadows, sheltering behind others, who he claims are not the only directors of the company to the exclusion of himself. He is not held out as a director by the company. Uh, again, as, as I pointed out earlier, though, the difficulty with Mr. Justice Millett's definition is that it conflates two things. Um, a shadow director is not characterized by the amount of hiding they do, but by how indirect their influence is. Um, if you go around just being a director and never use the word director to describe yourself, odds are you'll be found to be a de facto director. A shadow director is different, not because they're subtle and not because they eschew the label director and don't wear a director's hat, but because they work through someone else. They provide advice, they provide counsel, they provide instruction, perhaps, and the other directors act on that basis. Um, in the most extreme case, it would be a puppet master situation in which it's a shadow director who's pulling the strings. But the reason they do that, the reason that they are a shadow director is not because of their subtlety, um, but because they are shadowing or, or following um, or allowing rather or uh, the, the actions of the real director, and in this case, directing them. And in terms of the uh, the further the further providing further definitions, we look we can look at a case like the Secretary of State in Deverell. This is a case in uh, relation to the uh, in relation to director's disqualification. Um, and what's noted here is that the definition that's given, and a similar statutory definition is given in the Director's Disqualification Act, uh, as as against the Companies Act. Um, the reason is uh, the reason is, uh, is is that it's targeted at the mischief um, that the Director's Disqualification Act is being used in an attempt to prevent, uh, in this case, protection of the public uh, from dodgy directors who, who will do very bad things. All right, 
So we now have some some idea of what it is, what a de facto director is, and what a, a shadow director is. Uh, how do we identify them? Um, well, first of all, it, the question, the first question we need to ask ourselves is, is it an objective test or a subjective test? And unsurprisingly, it's an objective test to determine whether or not we're looking at who really is a director after all. Um, one of the first cases that we may have, you may have seen a reference to on an earlier slide where we introduce the new concept of what it is to be a de, uh, de facto director uh, comes in the case of re low line electric motors. Uh, again, this is a company disqualification case, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and in that case, you have a formally appointed director uh, who leaves and goes to America, leaves the respondent to manage the business in the UK. Uh, the respondent is, has resigned uh, as the director, but carries on working. Well, again, it's the purpose that we're looking to. And that's what uh, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Nicholas Brown Wilkinson looked, looked to. Uh, with the effect being, uh, with the effect being that the respondent in this case uh, could be held as the to be a de facto director. Uh, and I just have a comment, and it's a very good point. It's just that the de facto directors, uh, as a general rule, uh, tend to attend board meetings. Uh, shadow directors tend not to, uh, which makes sense given what we've seen earlier in terms of de facto directors uh, take carrying on matters in their own right. Uh, and acting as though they are a director, and as a result, having the accoutrements thereof. Um, it's an interesting point, especially and a very timely point to make as we come to this slide. Uh, Mr. Justice Miller, again, in the early case of Hydrodam, had said in terms of trying to determine um, whether or not a, um, uh, a person uh, falls under the, the uh, scope of being uh, a de facto director, is he says, well, the attendance of board meetings and voting with others may in certain limited circumstances expose someone to personal liability, uh, but it does not, without more, constitute him to be a director of any company of which his company is a director. Um, now, the, re the Supreme Court case of Holland, which I'll get on to, surveyed all of the case law that's gone on in terms of de facto directors and said that there'd been a fairly unhelpful line of authority following Mr. Justice Millett's judgment in Hydrodam, in which the courts were always looking for that elusive something more. And Lord Collins said, well, really, when you're trying to find a de facto director, you, you don't sort of sit under the palm tree and try and think it to yourself, well, what is this something more that has to happen? Uh, the question is, you've got to consider whether or not the de facto director is part of the governing corporate governing structure of the composite companies, and whether they assumed a role in relation to those companies, which imp imposed upon them the fiduciary directors of a direct uh, fiduciary duties of a director. That's quite complicated, and it arises from this problem. Uh, in many cases, company directors are themselves companies. Now, through the Companies Act, every company has to have at least one natural person. Um, but suppose. Uh, company A has sitting on its board Company B, uh, and Company B uh, has Mr. C as a director. And Mr. C attends meetings uh, for the board of Company A, wearing his hat of Company B. Now, Mr. C uh, behaves in such a way as one would expect uh, of someone attending meetings. Uh, are they a shadow director? Are they a de facto director? The answer appears to be, again, you need something more. Uh, it's not good enough if you are simply acting with your hat as director of company B when you attend company A's meetings. That's not enough. Uh, and that's what, by majority, uh, the UK Supreme Court decided in the case of Holland. So the question is, are you going outside uh, the bounds uh, of what your own corporate personality in reference to company B, my um, The Moorgate Medals case I cited earlier, I uh, said, let don't look for one single factor, look to a variety of factors as to whether or not somebody's going to be a de facto director. Uh, and there are a number of factors were taken into account about the respondent. And I have to say, this was a fairly clear case. 
Uh, it was a de facto director's case in con- in connection with a company's uh, company director's disqualification order. This was a case in which the respondent had their fingerprints all over the company, start to finish, uh, and even though they were usually eschewing the label director, from what I can uh, recall from the case, they were referring to themselves as a partner or would we'll, we'll have seen this plenty of times as, as a manager uh, and basically taking on all of the major responsibilities uh, in conjunction uh, with the other director of the company. Uh, they were held to be a de facto director and therefore subject uh, to the strictures of a disqualification order. And again, I, I've cited a, a, a bit more authority here to the extent to which is, it's a question of degree. Um, you take into account all of the factors uh, that go into uh, that go into uh, the, the the person's role within the company, and ask, are they part of a uh, and uh, ask, are they part of the corporate governing structure, and to what extent? Um, the question of management accounts, which was uh, central in the case of. I don't know if it's pronounced Tajolo, which I just cited, um, got some pushback in the Hollier case by um, Mr. Uh, uh, by Mr. Just Etherton, where the question was, well, what what sort of uh, accounts do you need access to? Uh, in Tajolo, it was taken into account uh, that I believe in those cases, not only were they restricted from receiving documents central to the company's decision making, they were kept under lock and key. Um, and what Mr. Jasetherton said was, well, it's one thing to say, I can't see the information, but that's not enough. If you're behaving like a director, even though you don't have good information, that, that doesn't exclude you from being a de facto director. Um, but it might be slightly different if there's a deliberate policy of preventing a person from gaining access to, uh, to relevant information, i.e. if you have to go through somebody else in order to get anything done. Now, that might mean that you're still a shadow director, but if you're constantly having to answer for your conduct to the actual directors, uh, and they're the ones calling the shots, that's going to push you away from being a de facto director um, if you can't exercise any sort of autonomy. So I think it's a useful question in these contexts, not just to ask, what can you do? What have you the power to do? But what don't you have the power to do? Are you answerable to someone else in terms of making corporate governance decisions? So what about shadow directors? Well, again, we can start with Hydrodam, uh, and we get a, a classic definition, which is largely uh, reflected uh, in the Companies Act uh, and indeed in the uh, Company Directors Disqualification Act. We're looking for people who are directors of the company, um, that someone else is directing them as to how to act, and that the directors acted in accordance with such directions uh, as a matter of custom. Uh, That seems straightforward enough. Um, The Deverell case, again, one of the leading cases here, again, in the context of a a director's disqualification case, um, notes that it doesn't have to be that that influence has been directed over the whole field of corporate activities. So in other words, it doesn't have to be that every time the director sits down and say, oh, gosh, what do we do? We better ask Smith what to do. And then Smith calls all the shots. Um, there nevertheless has to be some element uh, by which the shadow directors, uh, outside the co- context of professional advice, whereby the shadow director's word is being habitually followed. Notably, what Deverell in the, in the Court of Appeal uh, did was to row back from any suggestion that there had to be subservience or surrender of discretion by the board. It might be enough uh, that there was simply a a habit of following. Now, if there is subservience, if there is a complete voiding by the directors of any decision-making autonomy, and they simply say, we'll rubber stamp anything you send us, again, that's very indicative that you might have a shadow director on the other end. However, um, However, that isn't necessary. That isn't always going to be necessary. All right. Um, so we've looked at the question of, of who de facto directors and shadow directors are and the related question of how it is that we might identify them. Um, what consequences follow? Well, the answer is it depends upon the context. And as I said at the beginning, there's lots of different reasons we might have for wanting to point at someone and say to them, OK, I know you're not a jury director, 
but I'd like to label you as a director anyway. I, I, I'd like to call you. Uh, I'd like to call you by that name. I think it's helpful when we go through and look at the consequences. We consider a purpose of approach, and I think that's the way in which a lot of the very young area of law that we have here is trending. It's asking us what's the purpose of this thing that points to director, de facto director, shadow director. Why are they in the frame as such? Uh, and is that purpose well served in this case? Uh, the result being that often reading across definitions from one set of cases to another can be quite difficult. Um, it's very true that, for example, in company directors disqualification act cases, you'll have definitions which are cited in cases where liquidators are pursuing delinquent shadow or uh, de facto directors. But it's not always a clean read through. It's not always one-to-one. -one. For example, in a Company Directors Disqualification Act case, the question that you have before yourself is binary. Is this person a director? Was this person a director or not? Uh, and as a result, the way in which you analyze it is going to be more context specific. And I think, and I know I'm running out of time, um, that 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 sense of context is now informing the way in which the courts have looked at things more recently. And I'd especially look to the Holland case as an example uh, of where in the case of a de facto director uh, analysis, what the court by majority said is, you look to what duties that person is undertaking. And in the case of a shadow director, I would say that's actually even more the case that you need to look at things in a contextual uh, light. Uh, and this case is very interesting in that both sides conceded as part of their analysis in the case of Instant Access Properties Limited that a de facto director is in the same place as a de jure director. But I think the analysis here that the court gives is quite limited, um, where I think it's Mr. Justice Morgan uh, um, says, well, if you're a de facto director because of your defect in your appointment, you're a director in every case. You're as much a director as someone who's a de jure director. And I think that's right. But I think what the Holland case indicates is that you can have cases where, first of all, we know there are cases where that isn't the case. You're a de facto director, not because of a defect in appointment, but because you've been acting like a director. But you can act like a director in, to a greater or lesser extent, and in particular contexts. Um, it, it's. I think it's too much to say, well, because you are a de facto director, if your appointment is invalid, therefore all de facto directors owe all the same duties all the time as a de jure director. I'm not always. I'm not sure that's a fair analysis. What I think is more interesting is the question that came up in that case, the analysis that's brought of being a shadow director. So you can take a basic architecture of the sort that Mr. Justice Millet would have us take in the Hydra Dam case, where you go through a checklist and say, well, are you, you know, uh, do we have a board? Do they follow this person? And do they do so as a matter of habit? And Mr. Justice Morgan critiques that and says, might it not be preferable instead to ask what are the fiduciary duties that are owed by this person? And I think that analysis can be borne out by asking what happens if we take a shadow director and trace them all the way across and say they now are a director in every single way as a de jure director. And I think that creates problems. Let's give an example. A, a de jure director owes all of the statutory duties in the Companies Act at sections 171 to 177 including, for example, promoting the best interests of the companies. It's an onerous set of obligations, and it's a positive set of obligations. You can't just sit back as a director and do nothing. But if you're a shadow director, imagine someone who in a particular field is constantly advising the company and is always providing advice, not professional advice, that the company always habitually acts on, but only in one particular field of the endeavor of that company. Well, sounds like a shadow director to me. They're involved in the governance of the company, they're acting through others, they're habitually followed, et cetera.
<clears throat> but as Mr. Justice Morgan points out, simply saying, well, then they're a director in the same way as every other director seems wrong. It seems right to say that if in that very narrow bandwidth in which they are exercising their authority and control, they are in some way screwing up and breaching fiduciary duties, that they should be held liable. But suppose that company um, falls because it fails to keep proper accounts or because Mr. Smith, who's the shadow director sitting in the back, has not taken any steps to promote uh, the success of the company. Should he be liable simply because in one field of endeavor where his own work was unimpeachable, he was giving advice which was habitually followed? And I think the answer must be no. And I think the tendency of the courts that we're starting to see and we have instant access properties in the case of shadow directors, we have the Holland case in respect of de facto directors, is trending us towards, is saying it's not just enough to say as soon as you fall into the camp of being a de facto or a shadow director, you're a director for all purposes. You have to look at the purpose, both of the statute, both of the regime that you're under, and the specific conduct that's being identified in relation to which you may owe the duties of a director that is to say, fiduciary duties. And I apologize because I've run a bit over time, but that's what I'd intended to share. I can't see the Q&A function. I can see the chat. So if anyone has any questions they'd like to put, if they could, I'll keep the chat open for uh, a few moments. Uh, and if you'd like to, to leave any comments there, uh, I will do my best to answer them. Ah, we've had a very good question come in. Uh, how can a manager avoid being considered a director? Um, I think the short answer is uh, putting as much space between them and the decision-making process. So certainly not, uh, though we've already had a bit of a discussion about board meetings, uh, certainly not showing up for the board meetings and allowing those to be handled by the director would be uh, of use. Um, ensuring that the director has to ratify decisions uh, and can take independent advice in doing so uh, might be another way. It will always be a contextual case-by-case -case, uh, basis as to whether or not a, a, a manager can put enough distance between themselves uh, and the directors themselves. Um, but it seems to me that as a general rule, what you want to be doing uh, is ensuring that the director is making autonomous decisions. Uh, another way is ensuring that the director is the one receiving the relevant professional advice uh, and making their own judgment, taking those matters into account. Um, so, in, in short, in a case uh, that, for example, the, the case that uh, Mr. Justice Nichols considered, where the only de facto director had, had run away to America and the respondent was running the whole show start to finish, well, that's not going to work. Uh, you want to make sure that your director is doing some real work and real governance and management uh, and isn't simply doing what you say. And as I say, putting in an, an independent stream of advice or in, independent counsel and having the director make their decisions independently uh, is probably a good principle to follow in terms of creating that distance. OK, I think those are the all the questions we've got. If any occur, of course, please do email into Chambers either directly or, or to my clerks and I'll, I'll do my best. And if I don't speak to you beforehand, uh, have a Merry Christmas.